Hello, multivariable calculus students. This is Mr. Johnson, and this is a continuation of our section 9.4 on cross products. And what we're going to talk about on page 23 now is the component form of cross products and how to um, use determinants basically to make the, the formula a little bit easier. I had mentioned in the previous video that with a dot product, you're focused on multiplying similar components. So the x component of vector a multiplied by the x component of vector b, y component of vector a multiplied by the y component of vector b, and so on. With the cross product, when we look at the component form, we are looking at mixing that up. We're looking at trying to combine the um, things that are not similar in order to look at the vector that is produced by the cross product. Notice in the formula that we are not getting a number. We are getting a vector when we do the cross product. Okay, uh, you can also see that it is much more extensive than the dot product. The dot product is much faster, and with the dot product, you get a number, not a vector. So let me review with you really quickly determinants. This is from pre-calculus. I believe it's probably the last time you've seen this. If you're an IB student, maybe in, in the IB classes you've seen it. A determinant um, in, <clears throat> let's see, even higher algebra was typically just two by two. Um, you might have used a calculator, you might have done a little bit by hand. Here is the formula. If you have A, B, C, D, so you have a 2 by 2 matri matrix here, and you're looking for the determinant, you take the, the uh, A times D, so you take that kind of cross there and subtract the multiplication of B and C, and then you get a number. That's your determinant, and it has all sorts of meaning in other classes. In our particular class, the way we're going to use determinants is to uh, essentially build our cross product formula. So you can go and memorize all of this in the cross product formula, but I think it's easier to utilize determinants. Let me show you a three by three really quickly. So three by three, let's say it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. So the way this works, you just have to stay really organized, is that you take A, let me use a different color. You take A and you multiply A by the 2 by 2 matrix associated with the numbers that are below the row of A and not in the column of A. So what I mean by that is that A is in the first row and the first column. So A is multiplied by the 2 by 2 matrix that is not in the first row and not in the first column. So what we would have then if I can just undo some of that, is um, A multiplied by the matrix E, F, H, I. Now the next part, based on our formula for a determinant, is that you actually subtract the next element. You always subtract the next element. It is one of the easiest things to forget. Now what we're looking for is B multiplied by the two by two matrix that is not in the first row and not in the second column. So we're looking at those elements of the matrix that we have. So we have B multiplied by D, F, G, I. I know some of you are probably thinking right now, is this really easier than just memorizing the formula for the cross product? Well, that certainly is up to you, but I think in the end, it really is easier. Okay, now we have C, and C will be, uh, let's, let's go with, uh, I'm trying to pick a different color here. We'll go with yellow. So we have C, and that's going to be, that's going to multiply the two by two um, matrix that will be not in the first row, not in the third column. And so for C, what we have is D, E, G, and H. Okay, so if you were to simplify this then, utilizing the 2 by 2 determinant that I had shown you above, you get A multiplied by E times I minus F times H minus B times D times I minus F times G plus C times D times H minus E times G. And you can see that there are so many elements here that cause you the potential of messing up, that the cross product is just cumbersome, but it's all algebra. So that's the good news. 
Okay, let's see if this actually works. Now, the way that we do this with vectors is that when we set up our cross product, um, or our, sorry, our, our matrix for our um, cross product, we set up the first row as the unit vectors i, j, and k. Then the next row is going to be our first vector, which happens to be a. So I'm going to do a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. Then the second or the, excuse me, the third row um, is going to be B, which is going to be B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3. All right, if we use our formula, we have vector I multiplied by the 2 by 2 matrix A2, A3, B2, B3, minus J times A1, A3, B1, B3 and then k, and that would be a1, a2, b1, b2. Now if we were to find the determinants of each of those, we would get i multiplied by a sub 2, b sub 3, minus a sub 3, b sub 2. You can see that that matches the very first component of our formula there. Then we have minus j, and that's going to be multiplied by a sub 1, b sub 3, minus a sub 3, b sub 1. You'll notice that this one doesn't perfectly match. It's almost the same, but keep in mind you are subtracting this middle component. That's why it does perfectly match. Not, not what's on the inside, but if you were to multiply a negative through, you would get exactly what's in the formula. And then the final one, would be k multiplied by a sub 1, b sub 2, minus a sub 2, b sub 1. <clears throat> and again, that matches the third component in our formula. So the determinant can be a helpful tool. I personally use it. I do not memorize the formula. Um, and so I would suggest utilizing it. OK, I'm going to go through just example 4 and 5 here, which are not directly connected to vectors. but uh, it does actually carry through to some of the things that we will use in this particular section, um, but it's also just kind of good to review just to make sure you understand how to calculate these. So for example, 4, we have 2 times 4, and then we're going to subtract 1 times negative 6. So we have 8 plus 6, so this is going to give us 14. And that's our determinant for number 4. And then number 5 is the 3 by 3, so we have 1 multiplied by uh, 0, so we'll take, I'll, I'll walk you through this, we have 0 times 2, so 0, minus 1 times 4. And then we have minus, again, don't forget that middle term, that's a, that's a minus there. And then we have 2, that's going to come from this uh, row and column. And then we have 3 times 2, so 6, minus 1 times negative 5. So we'll have... 6 plus 5, and then we'll add plus, and then we have negative 1, and then we're going to multiply by, uh, let's see, 3 times 4, so 12 minus 0 times negative 5, so 12 minus 0, so just 12. Okay, so then if we just simplify this, we'll get negative 4 minus, so that's going to be 11 times 2, so minus 22, and then minus 12. And so then we get in total there negative 38. Okay, let's do example six. So here's our very first cross product between vectors. So we have A cross B. So let's go ahead and set it up with our matrix. We have our unit vectors I, J, and K. And then we're going to put the components of A first. So we have one, three, and four and then 2, 7, and negative 5. So we calculate this, we'll have the vector i multiplied by 3 times negative 5, so negative 15 minus 4 times 7, so 28. Don't forget your minus j times uh, 1 times negative 5, so negative 5, and 2 times 4, so minus 8 plus k. That's going to be multiplied by 1 times 7, so 7, minus 3 times 2, so 6. 
And so if we simplify this down, we have, um, let's see, negative 43i, and then we have minus um, a negative 13. So we have plus 13j and just 1k. So that's going to be our vector, which again is perpendicular to both a and b. Um, and then if we were able to kind of visualize this, which would be very difficult given the circumstances in space here, but we would we could visualize that and actually pick exactly where that vector is located using the right hand rule. Okay, let's go on to the next page. Okay, on this page, what we're going to do is look at one of a handful of proofs of the pro cross product. So there, there are a number of different proofs that you'll find out there. Um, this one is very heavily algebraic and um, it just shows you where the components of the cross product come from. So let's go ahead and let a be a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, and then b will be uh, b sub one, b sub two, and b sub three. Okay, so let's go ahead and assume then that, um, that a and b um, have a cross product that is not the zero vector. And let's, let's say that the uh, cross product that we have between A and B is going to be some vector C. So in other words, what we're going to say is that um, there's, there's some vector C, which is perpendicular to both A and B. Now, if that's the case, we could go back to the idea of dot product that we did in section 9.3, and, and we know then that A dotted with C is going to be zero, and B dotted with C is going to be zero. So that's one of the things we learned in section 9.3. So if we already use the components of our vectors A, B, and C, then we have two different equations from this. We have A sub one, c sub 1, a sub 2, c sub 2, a sub 3, c sub 3 equal to 0. So that will come from our first equation that we have there. And then we have a similar thing with b dot c. So I'm going to pause and write that one out. Okay, so what we have is two different equations, and it's coming from the idea that we have some vector that is going to be perpendicular to a and perpendicular to b. And so based on the dot product formula, we know that we have these two different relationships. In the first one, we're going to multiply by b sub 3. We're going to set up a system of equations so that we can eliminate and then start to solve these things. What, what we're looking for um, in the end, I'll write right up here, is some vector c such that we can find c sub 1 c sub 2 and c sub 3. That's what we're looking for. And we want to know what those elements of c are with regard to a and b. So that's our goal behind all of this. Now in the second equation, we're going to multiply by a sub 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute um, this the green writing that I've just done in both of these equations. I'm going to pause and write that out. Okay, so I've written out and distributed through the green writing that I've, I've put in there. And we're going to take these two equations now, and we will subtract the second one from the first. So we'll have a sub 1, b sub 3, c sub 1, minus a sub 3, b sub 1, c sub 1. That's going to come from our first term here in, in each of the equations as we subtract. And then we have the second one, so we're going to have a sub 2, b sub 3, c sub 2, minus a sub 3, b sub 2, c sub 2. And then if you notice, we have the last term in each one being canceled, being eliminated. And that was sort of the whole goal here is to start to simplify this down a little bit. Now, one of the elements that we're going to see as similar in each of the first two terms is C sub 1. And in the second two terms, uh, or the second set of terms will be C sub 2. So I'm going to factor out those values. So C sub 1 is going to be factored out of the first two terms only. And C sub 2 will be factored out of the next two terms.
Now, there's a lot of possibilities here in terms of potential solutions, but I'm going to manipulate one of them to help us um, work through and find this vector C and make up the components in terms of A and B. So I'm going to claim that one possible solution among many to this equation that I have is if c sub 1 was equal to a sub 2 c sub 3 excuse me a sub 2 b sub 3 minus a sub 3 b sub 2 and c sub 2 is going to be equal to the opposite of a sub 1 b sub 3 minus a sub 3 b sub 1 okay so here's what i'm doing i'm letting c sub 1 be this factor which is made up in in our second term here so in other words c sub 1 is going to be this factor multiplied by a sub 1 b sub 3 minus a sub 3 b sub 1. i'm going to let c2 be this term from the first except the opposite because then if i was to add up all of this stuff i would get zero so it's kind of like the idea of the zero product property but we're, we're being creative here okay um, this means that c sub 2, if you distribute the negative, is going to be a sub 3, b sub 1, minus a sub 1, b sub 3. Now, if you notice, the reason that I chose these, number one, is that it causes the equation that I have here in, in black to be zero. So it works, number one. But number two, if you were to refer back to your cross product formula on the previous page, C sub 1 is the very first term, uh, or component, I should say, in the vector for the cross product between A and B. It matches perfectly. C sub 2 also matches perfectly. So in other words, these two, um, these two phrases that we've identified here are the first and second components in this vector C, which would be perpendicular to both A and B. So what we have to figure out now is what would be the component for C sub 3? What would be the third component of all of this? So let's utilize the, the first equation I had with the dot product. I'll just scroll up here for a minute. So I had A dotted with C equal to 0. So I'm going to use that one. You can use either one. It does not matter here. Um, but if we utilize that one, we have uh, A sub 1, C sub 1 plus a sub 2 c sub 2 plus a sub 3 c sub 3 and it's equal to 0. So I'm going to take and substitute in my values that I've found for c sub 1 and c sub 2. So I have a sub 1 times and now I'm going to substitute in what we found for c sub 1 and then I have a sub 2, and I'll substitute in what I've found for c sub 3. And then we still have a sub 3, c sub 3, and it's equal to 0. All right, I'm going to take a moment to just simplify this. I'm going to pause the video. Okay, so here I've distributed it, and if you notice, there is a term that we can cancel here, and what we're left with is just these three little sets and every single one of those three pieces has an a sub 3 in it. So I'm going to factor out an a sub 3 and get negative a sub 1 b sub 2 and uh, plus a sub 2 a sub uh, excuse me a sub 2 b sub 1 and c sub 3 and it's all equal to 0. Now, utilizing the zero product property, yes, a sub 3 is there and could potentially be 0, um, but we're not really concerned with that. What we're trying to figure out is what is an equation for c sub 3. So I'm going to take out this little piece here, which could be equal to 0, and I'm going to solve for c sub 3. So c sub 3 is... Could, we could write it as a sub 1, b sub 2 minus a sub 2, b sub 1. And again, if you were to compare this to the cross product formula on your previous page, 
it matches uh, perfectly that third component. And so if we put everything together for vector C, we put all of the components in place, we get our cross product formula. Okay, so there it is. So that's just one of the ways you can look at this cross product formula. Um, it isn't the only way, but it has a lot of algebraic manipulation and, um, and kind of movement, but it, it gets down to the heart of the formula. Again, I think using the ter determinant is easier than memorizing the formula, but I hope it's helpful to at least see this proof. So I'm gonna show you one more really quick proof here. And this one has to do with the, um, the area of the parallelogram. Now that you know so much information about the components of the cross product, um, I just wanna show you this really short little thing. You, if you have room on this page, you certainly can use that room. If not, and you're in the paper packet, on page, starting on page 49, there's a, a few blank pages and you can go to those blank pages and add some of this in. That's what those blank pages are intended for if you ran out of space. So what I'm going to do here is, is show you the, um, how the cross product interacts with the area of the parallelogram. And if you remember, we have the situation where we have two vectors in a plane. So let's say that this vector is B and this particular vector is A. And if we were to sort of put these together and then project them across, then what we have is this parallelogram. And the idea here is we want to find the area. And I, I had told you originally early on that the area was the, the magnitude of the cross product between the two vectors. And the formula that I gave you was the magnitude of A multiplied by the magnitude of B multiplied by the sine of the angle between them. And that angle is right here. So that's our formula. Well, now that you know the component form, I wanna show you how the component form connects because the component form obviously is the exact same thing as calculating with the angle, but the components um, will show up geometrically. Um, and it, it's kind of just an interesting idea and an interesting connection between formulas. So let's start by labeling vector B. So the way I've drawn it, uh, I've kind of moved it um, off into this first quadrant a little bit, and we're just keeping with just a plane just to keep it simple. So with B, what we have is some component horizontally and some component vertically along the y-axis. And because we are on a plane instead of space, then the Z component is zero. For A, it's a little simpler. So we have an, a horizontal component along the X, but it doesn't move uh, vertically. And so we have zero for the Y component as well as zero for the Z component. So first what I'm gonna do is take the cross product between these two. So we have, let's see, A sub one and zero, zero, and B sub one and B sub two and zero. And again, this is just the cross product between A and B. So then this gives me, if I was to you know, look at my cross product here, I have zero times zero minus zero times B sub two. So we have zero for our I vector minus, and then for J, we have A sub one times zero and B sub one times zero. So we have zero again, not very interesting so far. And then for K, we have A sub one times B sub two, and then minus zero. So what we have is a sub one and b sub two for k. All right, now <clears throat> the magnitude of this particular vector is pretty simple because it just has that one component that's showing up that's not zero. So if we were to take the magnitude of a crossed with b, it would simply be the square root of a sub one b sub two squared, which of course is just a sub one b sub two. Now, a sub one in our diagram up here is simply the magnitude right here of a. So the magnitude of a is actually 
a sub 1 because a is relatively boring. It just goes along the x-axis. It doesn't go vertically at all. b sub 2 happens to be just the vertical because, again, look at our component here. It's the y component. So b sub 2 is the vertical component of the vector b. Now, think about it in terms of the parallelogram. That also is the height. So if this is the height of our parallelogram, if a sub 1 is the base of our parallelogram, then the area of the parallelogram is simply the height times the base, which, guess what, is exactly the same thing that we are finding using the cross product. So there's a little bit of a connection there geometrically along with the um, component form for the cross product. And so I just wanted to show you that. It's pretty short. Um, you know, saying it's a proof is, is, a, is a little bit of a loose term, but um, it, it does connect the two, and I think it's kind of interesting. So hopefully that was helpful. That will do it for those, um, those proofs for that. The remaining videos for this particular section will cover just examples uh, along with the cross product and some of the applications that we use cross products for. Thank you.